Well, good morning, everybody. It's my intention over the next 20 minutes to look at the human element of competence and the ability of the current CMSs that we have <laughs> to prevent human failings. There is a lot of information to go through and not a lot of time to do it, so please bear with me. It is my first time here at a step change uh, seminar, so please play nicely. We all know that assuring competence of staff is an essential part of risk management in major accident hazard industries, and therefore, so com therefore a competency management system is, a, is an essential business critical system in its own case. Our experience at MBA has shown that there are extremes in the capabilities of the current systems that are out there to successfully manage anything other than the skills and knowledge. We need to be more aware of how we as human beings interact with our surroundings and how our personalities drive our individual contributions to the continued safe operations of the organisation. Often referred to as behaviour, attitude, mindset or personal outlook, I am of course referring to the human side of competence that often appears to be overshadowed by the other elements in the mix. The HSE in their excellent publication, Reducing Error and Influencing Behaviour, break human factors down into three core areas, the job, the individual and the organisation. I'd like to start by looking at the organisation because the culture and how it operates has the greatest effect on an individual's or group's behaviour. The culture needs to be such that it promotes employee awareness, involvement and commitment at all levels to the continued safe operation of the organisation. Through communication and training, the organisation needs to ensure all staff fully understand their role and how their actions and behaviours can contribute to or seriously affect safe operations. Part of that training must also reinforce the message that deviation from established systems, processes and procedures is not acceptable. It should set clear standards that need to be achieved and then it should rigorously reinforce this. Silent consent in our organisation is not acceptable. In the publication, the HSE states that we should think about what we're asking the staff to do, how we want them to do it and where we want them to do it. We must also give careful consideration to additional pressures, internal or external, being applied to staff and how these pressures, real or perceived, are likely to affect performance. With the current situation our industry finds itself in, has anybody in your organisation taken the time to think about how the current round of job cuts or changes to shift patterns is affecting staff morale and ultimately their ability to focus on the task in hand. Are we therefore setting up our staff to fail? If you think adventure is dangerous, try routine, it's lethal. I love that quote. I think it's straight to the point. And we talk a lot about routine in our industry. If we consider the job or task, what message are we giving out when we refer to the work as routine. Routine maintenance, what does that mean? If this is just routine, does my guard need to be up? We run the risk of establishing a mindset here. Don't worry, it's only routine. Normally with routine tasks, we find a generic risk assessment, possibly written a while ago. There should be a toolbox talk, maybe at the work site. But does that fully cover the individual's risk awareness? And is it always done? We need to ensure that the individual has a necessary situational awareness to carry out dynamic risk assessment as the task begins, as it progresses and as it ends. Because as individuals, we always look for shortcuts and a way to simplify everything we do, especially when doing routine or mundane tasks. The more we do any task, the more proficient we become, but also the more complacent. We follow the procedure to the nth degree when we first start doing anything until we get used to it. And then we reach the state where we don't use a procedure anymore because we've done this a million times. When complacency creeps in, things can get forgotten or missed. 
How many accidents or incidents have occurred in our industry during routine operations compared to non-routine because non-routine tasks are normally risk assessed and planned massively? If you look at the airline industry for a moment, we will see that to prevent complacency happening, pilots are required to follow set checklists for tasks that they are required to do routinely, such as pre-takeoff or pre-landing checks, something that Menage picked up on earlier on in his presentation. These checklists has one pilot reading out loud the action that's required to be done and one confirming that the action has been done. And although routine to the pilots, these are critical, these tasks are critical to the safety of the flight. For the ground crew, mo the most routine maintenance carried out is what's known as the turnaround servicing. This occurs on an aircraft when it arrives at an airport. Under strict time pressures, the staff offload the passengers, carry out the inspections of the equipment and systems, refuel, replenish catering, clean the aircraft, reload the passengers, all to ensure that the aircraft leaves the ramp and meets its allotted time slot. To fail to do so will result in additional charges to that airline. Not that meeting the time slot would ever compromise on safety. And no one ever mentions that this is a routine servicing. The reason being, it's safety critical and staff should be fully aware and focused on the importance of these activities. Likewise, in our organisations, we need to focus staff members on how their individual contributions affect the overall performance of the task and the performance of others. Because if we get things wrong, or we take our eye off the ball, the results could be catastrophic. Whilst working at Centrica Hydrocarbon Resources Limited, I was fortunate to be involved in the delivery of process safety training, primarily at the GL Noble site at Spade Adam, but also at the Health and Safety Laboratory at Buxton. This was a deliberate shift at Centrica at the time from the personal safety training that was going around the organisation, which had the emphasis on reducing our LTIs. Organisations at that time proudly announced the number of days since their last LTI and even gave out t-shirts to their staff with so many hours without the last LTI. During this training, delegates were exposed to a range of fire and explosion demonstrations, as can be seen from the picture. The purpose of this training was to raise the situational awareness of the staff with what they were working with and what could happen if they were not fully concentrating on all aspects of a routine task and what would happen if what's in the pipe is allowed to escape. As individuals, we are all different and we all bring our own personalities to work. In your own workplace, you will have a range of personalities working there. Now these personalities can be strengths or weaknesses depending on the situation and the level of influence a particular individual has. Negativity can and will breed negativity if allowed to go unchecked and some individuals have a knack of stirring up others to vocalise or demonstrate this negativity whilst they themselves remain in the background. And unfortunately, individual positivity usually does not win out in the battle with collective negativity. This iceberg diagram is a useful image to demonstrate that our behaviours, the way we sh show ourselves and act with our colleagues, is controlled by a range of factors that we keep hidden. And these factors can be altered in such a way that it changes our behaviours. We all have a bad day, and when we have a bad day, people around us will say, oh, what's wrong with you? It's obvious to us straight away. Possibly the first indication of something going wrong with an individual is when they display behaviours not normally associated with them. We are all different in our personalities, but we are all the same in certain aspects. We are all rule breakers. Given the three images, when do we choose to actually travel at 70 miles an hour? Again, something that was touched on this morning. I would suggest 
that we all start travelling at 70 miles an hour as we pass the speed camera on the right and the graticule on the road. We should remember, though, that 70 miles an hour is the maximum speed allowed, but not the required minimum speed we should be travelling at. And who hasn't shouted at despair to the guy in the car in front asking, why are you doing 40 in a 60? Or words to that effect. We categorise rule breaking into what we consider acceptable and unacceptable, and rationalise that in the acceptable bracket, we're OK to disregard that rule. And we all know that we have a 10% allowance on the speed limit due to errors in the accuracy of the speedometer. So we rationalise that we'll be OK doing 77 miles an hour. If I asked all of you, what is the worst case scenario if you were speeding, I would probably suggest that most of you would say, getting caught, receiving a fixed penalty, and points on your licence. How many of us would say, I could kill someone? We would never kill someone intentionally, but we may cause the death of someone through driving at excessive speed. Insurance companies state that this course, speed awareness course, may be given to drivers who are caught at doing 10% plus 9 miles an hour over the speed limit. So for example, 86 in a 70 mile an hour zone. If you're travelling at 87, well, if like me, you commute home at the weekend by car, you may just want to take a note of the table on screen to work out your penalty. Insurance companies in the UK also now insist that you inform them of your attendance on any driving awareness course, and then they, obviously, put your insurance premium up. Research into what was the most widely floated law in the UK, i.e. speeding, saw that points and a fine was not a deterrent. Seven million drivers, seven million drivers, were caught and penalised for speeding in the four years prior to 2012. In that year, there were 35 million vehicles in use on the UK's road, of which 7 million of them were being driven by criminals. This course, which costs more than the penalty fine, but prevents the driver from receiving a driving conviction, uh, aims to make the driver more aware of the likely consequences of their actions on themselves and on other road users when travelling at inappropriate speeds. So how do we manage all this at work? How do we defend ourselves from all these rule breakers that are working for us? Well, we have our competency management system as one of the tools. It is a great, ma uh, it is a great risk management tool if used correctly. And at the heart of the competency management system are the standards of competence. The quality of these standards are crucial to the quality and integrity of assuring competence. As an industry, we talk a lot about generic standards for job roles, which are fine to a point, and they are, there is a place for them. However, whatever standards are used by your organisation must be tailored to the specific requirements of your installation. As an auditor, previously working for, for Apito, I found that most CMS standards are normally written around generic routine tasks, such as start up a system and run it to a stable state, monitor a system in normal operating condition, and safely shut down a system. And of course, as for system, I'm also referring to equipment. There may be other elements that ask for knowledge or demonstration of dealing with abnormal situations. However, it's unlikely that the assessor would be there when a complete system failure is occurring to assess the, assess the competence and behaviours of the individual dealing with it. And I would suggest that in a crisis situation like that, having an assessor around is the last thing you want. Therefore, at best, it's simulated, but more often than not, what we do is we ask questions. What would you do in, in that situation? What are your organisation standards like? If they're just around finding information from your information management system, then they're probably an insufficient measure of competence. Likewise, if someone is assessing somebody outside of their discipline, experience or capability, is that assessment actually worth anything? Or is it just a tick in the box? Around the system, 
there are four key interested parties, each with specific requirements. The organisation uses a CMS as a, as a risk management tool to satisfy its own requirements and those placed on it, <coughs> sorry, those placed on it by a regulatory body or for legal compliance. The individual should be using the CMS as an indicator of current competence to satisfy employment and possibly advancement requirements. However, again, as an auditor, I would say that we're still a long way from having the proper competence culture that we need in the industry because most of the responses I got from guys I interviewed was, I've been doing this 15 years, are you now telling me I'm not competent? The stakeholder, which is the client or shareholders or both, they use a CMS to ensure return on their investment through the continued safe operation of the organisation or through the safe contracted work being undertaken. And the regulator, they use a CMS to satisfy part of the organisation's requirement to comply with the safety case or coma. So can the CMS on its own protect any organisation totally against a human factors incident? Going back earlier this year, this individual stated that he would become infamous. Anybody know who it is? Is this picture any better? This is Andreas Lubitz. Andreas Lubitz was the first officer on board the German's wing flight who flew the aircraft into the Alps, killing all 150 people on board in an episode of what's known as aviation murder-suicide, which, whilst tragic, is not as uncommon as you would think. During the initial investigation, crash investigators were able to find six other cases where deliberate action by the flight crew had resulted in an aircraft being lost. Oh, sorry. In fact, research by the CAA the Civil Aviation Authority, had found that 75% of all aviation-related accidents are the result of some form of human failing. Pilots have to undergo medical assessments to establish their suitability and fitness to perform their job. They have extensive training to become competent, and they are subjected to regular assessment and reassessment to make sure that they can control the equipment and systems under any normal or abnormal condition. Sounds very similar to our industry, I would say. German wings had complied with all necessary regulatory requirements to operate and, and had the processes, systems and procedures in place to ensure all air pilots were competent and trained. Unfortunately, in this situation, an individual with a known history of medical depression was, and who was allegedly medically signed off on the day of the flight was allowed to fly the plane. The signs were there that his behaviour were changing by stating that he was going to become infamous. However, nothing in the systems picked this up. And have we now become too reliant upon the safety systems we have in place and overlooked the fact that they, have, they are unable to do anything other than report, hold and report on information inputs? A reaction through the airline industry to prevent unauthorised entry into the cockpit as a result of the 9-11 incident meant Andreas was able to fly a perfectly serviceable aircraft into the ground after deliberately preventing the captain from re-entering the flight deck once he'd left to go into the main cabin. It's also reported in newspapers that he'd practised the crash sequence during the flight down to Barcelona on the previous day. How lucky were those people on that aircraft? Flight data recorder information indicated that Andreas had, on five separate occasions, set the autopilot to 30 metres, which is 100 feet, whilst left alone in the cockpit. However, during that flight, he had let the captain back in when he'd returned from the cabin. Had he practised what he was going to do, or did he just chicken out on that particular day? We'll never know. But what is amazing is the fact that if an aircraft's flying at 36,000 feet and one of the pilots puts in a command to take it 35,900 feet down, you'd think somebody would know about it. 
Flight data recorder information also showed that at the last minute on the day of the crash, there was a definite flying input to the control, but it was insufficient to disengage the autopilot. So on that day, did he have second thoughts again at the end? Following 9-11, when the cockpit door lock system was introduced, nobody probably gave any thought to this situation ever occurring. If they had, perhaps they could have introduced a fail-safe way of opening the door from the outside. Who knows? Hindsight is a marvellous thing. So despite German wings meeting all their legislative requirements and following industry best practice for the training and competence of its staff, it would appear that the systems designed specifically in the aircraft industry to identify human factors and behaviours can fail and a human factors incident can still happen. So as an industry, we must ensure that our staff are trained in human factors and situational awareness to understand their role and their contribution to the maintaining safe operations. And we must develop competency management systems that add real value to the management of risk. MBA's concern is that organisations will identify suitable training. These will appear on training matrices or competency profiles. Individuals will be sent on this training. Matrices will be ticked and as when the courses have been completed. And then we'll sit back and say, there's a tick on the matrix, therefore the individual must be competent. So can a CMS on its own protect any organisation totally against a human factors incident? The answer's got to be no. If the system is developed properly, it will produce the information which, if analysed properly, could be an indicator that things are starting to go seriously wrong. But it relies on us to interpret, understand and act on what it's telling us in a timely manner. If we can do this, then we are the strongest link. But if we can't, or we use poorly designed, ineffective systems, then we really will be the weakest link. Thank you. <laughs>